Turn to Exodus 33. We got through verse 17 last time. And uh, again, this is one of the most amazing sections of Scripture, I think, in the entire Bible. And we'll see why here in a moment. Uh, but as you remember, the Israelites had failed miserably. And it happened because they grew impatient with Moses. He was up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, for 40 days and 40 nights with the Lord. That's where God gave him the Ten Commandments. God gives him instructions on how to build the tabernacle, how to offer up all the different sacrifices. I mean, so much over those 40 days that he instructed Moses. And then, because they were growing impatient with Moses being up there, the people come to his brother Aaron and they say, Aaron, make us a god so that we can worship God because we don't know what happened to this Moses character. So he tells them, take all the gold earrings off your ears, give them to me. And it says he fashions this gold calf and all the people begin to worship and they're celebrating and they're just getting in all kinds of sinful situations and it's brutal. And when Moses comes down from the mountain, he's joined by Joshua and they see this horribly sinful scene um, of idolatry, sexual immorality taking place. And as a result, it says that the Levites step forward and God has them strike down 3,000 Israelites. They're put to death because of their sin. So, obviously Moses is devastated. He smashes the Ten Commandments, the two tablets that God wrote with his finger. It says the Ten Commandments. He uh, takes the gold calf, he grinds it to powder, he throws it in some water, makes the people drink it, so that hopefully they'll have a bad taste in their mouth concerning idolatry. And so the people are stunned. They are embarrassed. Uh, they've just committed this horrible sin. But then God speaks to Moses in a very beautiful, powerful, loving, merciful way. And God says, I'm still going to take you and the people to the land of promise, even though they've sinned so greatly against me. I will send my angel before you. He will lead you up into the promised land. But I'm removing my presence from you. And that is when we saw Moses go into intercession mode. And he powerfully prays for the Israelites. He breaks down his own tent. And he moves it outside the camp of Israel. Because that's where God's glory was moved from. In the midst of them. Outside the camp. So God, you know, Moses says, I got to be where God is. So he moves his tent out there, and that becomes a temporary tabernacle as the glory of the Lord would descend upon the tent of Moses. So the picture we see in, in what we looked at last time is our sin is what separates us from God. It brings loss, and it brings distance between us and the Lord. You know, the Lord is with us always, but we can remove ourselves from that intimate relationship that we should be having with Him. But thankfully, that's not the end of the story Israel, as we've seen, they'll humble themselves, they would be forgiven by God, and that is a pattern we see throughout the Bible. When sinful people come to their senses, they humble themselves or repent of their sins, they turn back to the Lord, God is full of grace and mercy and love, and He will forgive and He will restore. Now again, Moses is in that mediator role between holy God and the sinful Israelites, and when God tells Moses, I'm not going to go with these people up into the promised land. Moses says, Lord, if you don't go with us, then we're not even going to go. What's the point? I mean, we would be, you know, unable to survive if you don't go with us. But through this amazing encounter, God is simply drawing Moses closer to himself, as well as Moses developing a greater love for the rebellious, stiff-necked people known as the nation of Israel. And when God says in chapter 33, verse 14, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest, he's speaking in the singular to Moses. But that's not good enough for Moses. Moses is like, Lord, I need you to go with all of us. I don't want you just being with me, but my heart is breaking for your people, the Israelites. And that's really what God is drawing out of Moses. He wants Moses to have the same heart of compassion for the people of Israel. Because remember earlier, Moses said, they're not my people, they're your people, God. And God says, they're not my people, they're your people, Moses. And they were going back and forth. But God is developing this heart of love for the Israelites. And that's what he wants to see with Moses. God's already called them 
my special people. He's already said, these are my chosen people, and he wants Moses to have that same heart of compassion for them as well. By the way, God wants us to have that same heart of compassion for the Jewish people today. They are still his chosen people. Even though most of the Jews are not following their Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, God is not done with them yet. And so don't buy into any of this anti-Semitism stuff out there or replacement theology that's going around that's so wrong because they teach that God is finished with the Jews and thus all of God's promises to Israel have now been you know, replaced by the church. Now we have been blessed in so many wonderful ways as the body of Christ, as the bride of Christ. And that is made up of Jews and Gentiles, but he's not done with the Jewish people yet. He is not going to uh, fulfill his promises to them until Jesus returns. And at his second coming, all the Jews who survived the Great Tribulation will get saved. Every one of them is going to turn to Jesus as their Messiah. And that will be fulfill the fulfillment of God's promise to them that he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. And the Jews are going to uh, be in their promised land, the fullness of what God gave them, which is so much bigger than what they have today. Anyway, don't think for a moment that God has forsaken them. The time for their blinders to come off to receive Christ is quickly approaching. This is how Paul says it. Look at these verses, Romans 11, verse 25. It says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel. And that's why we see so few Jews coming to Christ. But there are Jews getting saved all the time. Jews for Jesus, Chosen People Ministries. There's some great ministries out there reaching the Jewish people for Christ. But he says, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So all Israel will be saved as it is written the Deliverer, that's Jesus, will come out of Zion and will, he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, that's Israel, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so that's still in the future. It has not happened yet, so God is not done with them. But now we come to one of the most detailed descriptions of God the Father in the Bible, and God will give Moses the meaning behind his name, Yahweh. But first... Let's back up to verse 12, chapter 33, verse 12. Let's read through verse 17 here. It says, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way. And again, he wants to know God in a greater way. He wants to know more about God in his nature, in his character. And so that's an important thing for all of us, to want to know more about God. I want to know you, Lord. I want to grow in my relationship with you. He says, show me your way. I want to know your way, uh, that I may know you. And I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. Again, they're not mine, Lord. These are your people. And he, the Lord, said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Again, singular. Then he, Moses, said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. So now Moses is going to take it a step further. Not only does he want to know about God and the ways of God, now he goes even deeper. This is where we pick up in chapter 33, verse 18. This is why Moses is considered one of the greatest men in the Bible. It says in verse 30, or in verse 18, And he said, Please show me your glory. So I'm not just satisfied knowing things about you, God. I want to see your glory. I want to know you in a more real, more intimate way. Please show me your glory. Now that's an interesting thing to request, after all, he has seen 
some of the glory of God, just a little bit of the glory of God. I mean, the Shekinah glory of God came down in a cloud, the pillar, the pillar of fire. Uh, he saw God do all the mighty works there in the ten plagues in Egypt, parting the Red Sea. Um, when he was on the top of Mount Sinai, it says God descended in the cloud of glory. But it was just a little bit of God's glory. Here Moses knew there's so much more about the Lord that he had not yet seen. And so what a request. Please show me your glory. He had a hunger for God. And that hunger could not be satisfied by just knowing a little bit about God. And he wanted more. And it seems that the more of God that Moses experienced in his life, the more of God he wanted for his life. And that should be the same for you and me. It's one thing to know some things about God from the Bible, but we want to get deeper into God's Word. We want to know Him. We want to grow in our relationship with Him. When we are really uh, passionate about something, we really value something special, we want more. That's just a natural way that God has created us. If you like to fish, you're not satisfied if you catch some little six-inch trout. You know, you want more. You want bigger. You want, I got to get more fish. This is great. I love this. If you like to, and that's your passion to climb, and I don't know why, but some people like to climb, the 14ers, there's like 53 out there. They're not satisfied climbing, you know, two or three. They want to climb all 53. Some say 58. Because if there's a peak and there's like a little jagged, they'll say that's two peaks. Anyway, wherever the, you're not satisfied. You want to climb them all. That should be even more true when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. We shouldn't be satisfied with just thinking about the Lord, you know, Christmas and Easter. Not even, you know, once a week on a Sunday. We should be growing and seeking the Lord every single day of our lives. We want to draw closer to Him all the time. Jesus says this, Matthew 5, verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 6, 33, it's not on the screen, but it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. So when we have that kind of hunger for God, for His righteousness, He never sees it as a selfish thing. He sees it as a proper hunger that only Jesus can satisfy. John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, this is when Jesus is speaking to that desperate woman at the well of Jacob. And Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water, speaking of the natural well water, will thirst again. And you can put in there, whoever thirsts after anything of this world, it's not going to satisfy. You know, you can, you know, buy this new toy and then in three months when it breaks, you're dissatisfied. And then you want something bigger and better. That's not a good thing, by the way. That's not like fishing. <laughs> Anything can be an idol. So anyway, but you'll thirst again. You want more. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And he, he talks about that in John 7 where it's the rivers of living water, that's going to come over us. The Holy Spirit, you know, you don't get enough. You know, you want more. So here Moses says, please show me your glory. Again, he is about 80 to 81 years old at this point. He has seen so much. He's watched the Lord do so many amazing things, but he wants to experience more of the Lord. That's a good reminder for all of us. Don't ever stop pursuing a closer relationship with Jesus. Stay hungry. Stay thirsty. I mean, I've been saved for almost 47 years, and I've experienced a lot of great things by the hand of the Lord, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, the best is yet to come. You should have that kind of faith. No matter how great your life has been so far as a Christian, the best is yet to come. We're going to stand in His presence. We're going to see Him face to face. We'll be in our resurrection glorified bodies. It's going to be amazing. We've only scratched the surface of God and the love He has for us, His grace toward us, His plans and purposes for our lives. And so like Moses, we should also, we should ask big. You know, we should think big. We should trust big. 
We should keep stepping out in faith and see what the Lord might do in and through us as we walk with Jesus. And speaking of Jesus, when he came from heaven to earth, he laid aside his glory. He humbled himself. He committed himself completely over to the Father's will. And that's why he said, I only say what the Father tells me to say. I only do what the Father tells me to do. And it's only at the end of his earthly ministry that we find Jesus wanting something. Now what in the world could Jesus want? You know what he wants? He tells us. Look at this verse, John 17, 24. When he says, Father, I desire. That means I strongly want this. It's a strong desire. I want this. I desire that they also whom you gave me, that would be all of us who were born again, may be with me. He desires that we would be with him where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you have loved me before the foundation of the world. So what does Jesus want? He wants you and me there in heaven with him, experiencing his glory, his presence, being face to face with him. He, he longs for that. He can't wait to bring his bride home. That trumpet's going to sound pretty soon, I believe, and we're going to be caught up into his presence. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are the children of God. That's our position in Christ. If you're born again, you're his child. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In other words, a day is coming when we will be in his presence, in our resurrected, glorified bodies. Psalm 17, verse 15 says, As for me... I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. I mean, we think about, you know, being in the presence of the Lord, and that's awesome. That's the, that's the greatest of all. But then also to think, man, all of our loved ones who've gone home to be with Jesus, we're going to be reunited with them, and we're going to see them. I mean, those who have gone before us, spiritually, they're with the Lord right now. At the rapture, that's when they receive their resurrection bodies. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And so we get to see all of our loved ones. We get to hang out with Moses and David and the Apostle Paul and Peter and all these people in the Bible. It's going to be amazing, but above all, we're going to be with Jesus. So that's Moses' request. Please show me your glory. Here's God's response, starting in verse 19. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim, notice, the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So when God says that he's going to reveal his name to Moses, it means that God is going to reveal his divine nature and his character to Mo Moses, because what's behind the name is what matters. When we hear a person's name, certain characteristics, certain you know, traits, certain attributes will pop into your mind when you hear somebody's name. When you hear the name Joe Biden, you're thinking whatever you're thinking. When you hear the name Donald Trump, you're thinking, mm, yeah, okay. You know, when you hear the name, and you can fill in whatever blank, Hillary Clinton, you know, George Washington. I mean, whoever it is, certain traits come to mind when you hear that name. But when you hear the name Jesus, what pops into your mind? I mean, my mind is flooded with the Lord, the Redeemer. You know, he's my friend. He calls us friends. He's the Savior. He's our mediator. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says this about Jesus and his name. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his, notice, his name will be called, because these are the attributes of his name, 
Wonderful. There's nobody more wonderful than Jesus. Counselor. He's the greatest counselor of all time. Mighty God. Co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, by the way. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. We have peace with God. We have the peace of God. So his name really reveals a lot about who Jesus is. Why he came from heaven to earth. To reveal the nature and character of God the Father to us. Sinners who needed a Savior. And that's why Jesus says... You know, to Philip, have I been so long with you and you have not known me, Philip? He who's seen me has seen the Father because he reflects the Father perfectly to us. And because Jesus did everything exactly as the Father told him to do, we read these uh, words here in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, so the very top is Jesus, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now look at verse 20. So please show me your glory, verse 20, but he said, the Lord says, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. Last week we saw where it says God and Moses spoke face to face. But now he says nobody can see my face and live. In other words, nobody can see God in his full glory. If God showed up in his full glory right now in here, we would turn to crispy critters. We would be dust and ashes immediately. Nobody can stand in the presence of God's glory. That's why we will need our resurrection bodies. And so nobody can see me and live verse 21 and the lord said here is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock so it shall be when uh while my glory passes by that i will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while i pass by then i will take away my hand and you shall see my back but my face shall not be seen so the Lord says, okay, Moses, I will show you my glory, but with a couple of stipulations. You can't see my face. In your humanity, you would be vaporized when I show up in fullness of glory. So he says, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over the cleft of the rock, and you'll see me as I pass by. Now remember the old hymn, Rock of Ages. This is where that song comes from. Jesus is the true rock of ages. The hymn says, Jesus, rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. But what God is saying here is, Moses, you cannot see my full glory or you will die. But I'm going to put you in the cleft or it can be a, a crack, probably a cave. I'll set you in there and then I'll pass by and then you will see my back. The word back, it's, it's hard to translate because some versions say backside, some versions will say back parts. The reason it's difficult because God doesn't have a physical form here. And so when you see my back, it's more likely a better translation will be when I pass by, you'll see my afterglow. Because God, we'll see later on, not today, but... When Moses comes down the mountain after this, his face is just glowing. They put a bag over it to hide the, the dimming of the globe. He's, he's just glowing. It's just amazing. But it's like God is having to tone down his glory so that Moses wouldn't be vaporized. So as we'll see here in chapter 34, God is going to reveal his name to Moses. Now, again, one of the reasons this is so important is because here God is just declaring who he is. For a lot of people, this self-description of God is very eye-opening because a lot of people look at this and say, well, you know, the God of the Old Testament was mean and angry and nasty and just waiting for people to stumble, and then he's going to strike him with a lightning bolt. That's the God of the Old Testament. Then in the New Testament, Jesus shows up and kind of calms God down. So they look at these two different versions of God. Not true. God is not changeable. He's immutable. Jesus is immutable. And don't ever think that you know, there's a difference between the Old and New Testament gods. Malachi 3, 6. Very important. It says, For I am the Lord. I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. That's why you're not destroyed, Israel. Because I don't change. Again, he's got everlasting covenants for them. 
Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, and you can go back as many yesterdays as you want. That means eternity past. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Both of these verses speak of the immutability of God. In other words, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the same eternally. This is why any other God that doesn't fit into this description of God is a false God, because there's a lot of cults out there that will say, oh, Jesus is evolving, or our God was Adam and Eve, and they're evolving, and the Mormon God evolves. And they'll tell you very clearly, yeah, our God didn't know everything back then, but now he knows more, and he'll continue to grow because I'll be a little God, and I'm going to be growing forever also. That's not a God you can trust, by the way. There's only one God, and we'll see in a moment, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, eternally the same. John 1.18 declares, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Again, Jesus has revealed the Father to us perfectly. So, here is God the Father on full display for all of us to see. And what we see is His amazing kindness and goodness and grace and forgiveness and patience towards a very stiff-necked people. That's what Moses calls them. That's what God calls them, the people of Israel, the Jewish people. And we can be the same way, by the way. So look at chapter 34, verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke, Remember when he came down Mount Sinai, God had written on these tablets the Ten Commandments. When he sees all the Israelites rebelling, worshiping the gold calf, Moses breaks them. And so that's what he's referring to. Cut two more. Bring them up here. I'll sign them again. He lost his autograph. He's going to give you another one. So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you. And let no man be seen throughout all the mountain. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before the mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose up early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. So again, in direct obedience to the Lord, he takes these two tablets. He goes back up there. And he goes to the top of Mount Sinai. Now, on the top of Mount Sinai, there is a cave. Check out these pictures. This is the Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. Remember, Paul says Sinai is in Arabia. It's not in the Sinai Peninsula. There's a cave you see right in the bottom middle. Uh, that peak on the left is the burnt section of Mount Sinai that I believe is the real one. And so this cave is probably, possibly, probably, maybe, the place where Moses was when God passes before him. And then look at the other picture. It's a close-up of the cave. Now, another um, amazing event took place in the same cave 700 years later. And you'll hear about, and they even call this cave, Elijah's cave. Because remember when Elijah, he strikes down the 450 prophets of Baal. You know, God used them in a powerful way. Then the wicked queen Jezebel says, I'm going to get you. So he gets all terrified of the stupid queen Jezebel. He just struck down 450 prophets of Baal. So he runs for his life. It says he goes to Mount Sinai. He goes up into this cave, and he just is discouraged. He's downcast. He's like, oh, woe is me. I'm the only prophet left. So he's hiding in this cave, and this is why it's called the, the cave of Elijah. 1 Kings 19, starting in verse 11. It says, Then he, the Lord, said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire... A still, small voice. And that is when the Lord begins to encourage Elijah. He speaks to him, reminds him, no, you're not the only prophet left. I got 7,000 others who have not bowed their knee to Baal. And then he will give him further instructions. 
And so it's in that still, small voice the Lord spoke to him. So many times we're looking for God to do something dramatic. Lord, if you want me to go to India, write it in the sky. You know, or hit me with a lightning bolt right between the brain or in the, between the eyes. You know, you don't want that. You don't, you don't ask the Lord for that. But so often we're looking for these big dramatic things, but it's in that still small voice as you're reading through the Word, the Holy Spirit will take God's Word and impress something upon your heart in a wonderful way. So look at verse 5. This is where God begins to reveal His name. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So here's the name. And the Lord passed, by, uh, passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So this is how the Lord reveals his name. And again, his name reveals his character and his nature. This is how God defines himself. So we'll go through these uh, descriptive you know, verses here of the Lord's name. But the first thing we see as he passes by is God says, The Lord, the Lord God. Now, anytime the Bible repeats itself, it's for emphasis. When you go through and Jesus says, Truly, truly, or verily, verily, he's emphasizing something. And that's what God is doing here. And what is he emphatically stating is that there's only one true God. In other words, the God of the Bible is the only real, the only genuine God. Human beings invented literally millions of gods. They have millions of gods in India. They're all made up. They're all a concoction of somebody's twisted thinking. It's like the gold calf. They think this is a god. No, it's a, no, Aaron made it. It's not a god. There's only one true, genuine god. The, the only thing that opposes God is Satan, and he's developed all these other ideas that people think, oh, no, that's a god, or that's a god. Whether it's the Mormon god, the JW god, Christian science god, whatever it is, there's only one true God, and it's the God of the Bible. So the Hebrew translation of the Lord, the Lord God, is this, Yahweh, Yahweh, Elohim. That's very important to understand. The Lord, the Lord, God. Now, this would become the basis for, some say, the Shema or Shema. This is what every Orthodox Jew prays every morning when they get up. Every Jew that's Orthodox Jew prays this every morning. It's Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, the Shema. It comes from here. That first word is Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Something every Jew prays, every Orthodox Jew, every religious Jew. Now, interestingly, the Shema declares, literally saying, listen up, O Israel, or hear, listen up, O Israel, Yahweh, our Elohim, the Lord our God, Yahweh, is Ikad, one. Now, why is that important? And every Jew prays this. It's sad because they don't understand the true meaning of it, because it literally is saying the Lord, Yahweh, the one true sovereign, our Elohim. The word Elohim is the plural noun of God. Remember, in the beginning was... Oh, no, no, that's John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is the plural noun for God. El, E-L, is one singular. Elah is dual, two. Elohim is three or more. So our Lord, they're saying, Yahweh is Elohim. And then he says, our Lord Yahweh is Ikad. Ikad is the singular in a plural sense. It's literally the same word. It's called a compound unity. It's the same word used of Adam and Eve when God says the two become one. That's ikad. So here we got Elohim is one. The plurality of God is one. That's the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The one true living God. That's how God has manifested himself to us. 
Again, this is why Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is also why the definition here applies equally to God the Father and to Jesus. What we read of God saying, this is my name, it applies to Jesus the same. This is also why we cannot change the definition of who the sovereign Lord God Almighty is. There are some people, unfortunately many pastors, that are changing the definition of God, thus saying God didn't really mean what he said. I mentioned it last week. Every United Methodist Church in our valley wrote a letter. It was published last Sunday in the Daily Sentinel, the letter to the editor. We are now welcoming because our denomination has accepted every ABCD under the sun. And so if you don't feel comfortable in you know, a church like this that teaches the word, come here and we'll tell you what you need to hear about who you really are in your LGBTQ XYZ. And they say God's word doesn't really say that. No, God's word says this is sin, this is sin, this is sin. And if you don't believe what God says about sin, you're still in your sin. You're still lost. He loves you. Jesus died for the sins of the world. He's a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the whole world. The potential is there for anybody to get saved, but you've got to repent of your sin. If the Bible says, you know, homosexuality, lesbianism, you know, all these different things that are... Just read Leviticus 18. God goes into a great description of all these sexual sins, and some of them are like, oh, that's disgusting. And God says, yes, they are, and it's sin, and I will judge you for it. But here's the out. Come to Jesus, and he will save you. He will wash you clean. He'll turn you into a new creation. I was a dirty dog. Now I'm a sheep that gets dirty sometimes. <laughs> I, I was a, a pig wallowing in the mire, but now I'm one of his sheep. You're a new creation. If I'm still a dog, then I'm running back to the vomit, right? If I'm still a pig, I'm jumping right back into the mud hole. But no, I'm a new creation. He's the shepherd, and now I'm one of his sheep. If you're still a dog, then you're not born again. It's very simple. If you're still wallowing in the mire, and you're not turning over to Jesus, and you think, well, no, my God is tolerant of all these sins, then you're following the wrong God. There's only one God that has manifested himself in the word of God. And so if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Jesus said. Now, I love the God of the Bible because he cannot and he will not change. He doesn't change his mind about sin. Oh, that was, you know, Old Testament time. Or that was during the time of Jesus. You know, yeah, that was wrong then, but today it's okay. No, what was sin then is sin today. But what was forgiven then will be forgiven today. He doesn't change. If he promises eternal life, guess what? He will give you eternal life. He doesn't change his mind about forgiving us when we stumble and fall into sin. Again, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So look at these again. He says, I am the Lord, the Lord God. And then he says, I am merciful and gracious. Now, there are three words every Christian should know, basic Christianity, justice, mercy, and grace. We hear a lot of people saying, we want justice. Don't ever ask God to give you justice. Don't ever say, God, give me what I deserve, because that's what justice is. I want what I deserve. You know what I deserve? A lake of fire. And I'm pretty sure you deserve the same thing, because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. None, are, none righteous, no, not one. We all deserve the lake of fire. So justice, getting what you deserve. So here he reveals himself as the God who is merciful and gracious. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. I deserve the lake of fire, but God in his mercy says, you're not going to lake of fire. You're going to heaven. You're going to be with me forever and ever. The, the root word for mercy gives us the word for compassion. Our God is very compassionate. And then there's grace. Grace as you know, is getting what you don't deserve, like eternal life, eternity in the presence of Jesus. I don't deserve that. But God is gracious. He's merciful. And in His grace, He has freely forgiven us of all of our sins. And it's through the blood of Jesus that He shed on the cross as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. He took upon Himself the wrath and judgment I deserve for my sins, he absorbed it all as he hung on the cross. None of us deserve to be the bride of Christ. But Jesus 
is planning a great wedding feast for his bride. And I can't wait for all of us to be there. Everything we have as followers of Jesus is a result of his amazing grace. Then the Lord says that he is long-suffering. In other words, he is extremely patient with each one of us. One commentator says, God has a very long fuse. You know, when I was a kid, we got in trouble for it a few times, but it didn't stop us. We used to go down to Tijuana and we'd buy these M80s, which was basically a quarter stick of dynamite. Back then it was okay to do. You know, today you don't do it. Yeah, I know, you know. <laughs> but we, So this friend of mine, it wasn't me, it was him. I mean, he, he no, literally, he ordered this underwater fuse and he would dip the M80 in wax and had this underwater fuse. And we'd throw it in this little pond near our house and it'd just poof, blow up and fish would float up. And, you know, one time he threw it and he missed the pond and he landed on the bank. It sounded like a bomb going off, man. It blew up and then my dad came running out and he was a fireman at the time. He was mad. I mean, we had in such trouble for that. I don't know where I was going with that, but. Oh, yeah, yeah. He used to do a really short little fuse on those things. So a long fuse. So he actually, we, he got some long fuse, put it on this one, and we went on Lemon Avenue Elementary School. That's where I went to Lemon Avenue Elementary School. And now I'm in high school, I'm probably like a freshman. So they're over there, so they don't, want to, they don't care. Um, they don't listen to me. Don't listen to this tape. Anyway, so my, my friend and I, we went up on top of Lemon Avenue, and he got an M80, and he they had these big old spotlights, huge lights up there, and he strapped, tied it on there, lit this big old long fuse, and we just ran. We ran, ran, ran as fast as we could. I lived down the street from the school. Oh, you could hear this. <laughs> blew up the light. It was great. Well, the next week, they put a... <laughs> well, when you're stupid, yeah, it was great. So they put this like, eight-foot fence around the whole school property after that. So if you still, and it's still there today, it's like, yeah, I'm responsible for that. I'm sorry. I got busted for a couple things I did, but, you know, God is not quick-tempered, you know. He's got a, a slow to anger, one commentator says. And so then he says he's abounding in goodness and truth. In other words, God is not just a little bit good, if you've ever been by a big waterfall and you're standing there and it's so loud you can't hear it, you can have somebody yelling at your ear and you can't even hear them. It's such a loud waterfall. You know, if you're standing by something, it's just a little drip coming off the side of the hill. It's like, that's not any good. And that's not a waterfall. We got some of those around here. It's like, really? You call that a waterfall? It's just like down the side of a hill. It's like, there's nothing there. So he's, he's not just giving us a little bit of goodness. Here it says he abounds in goodness. That means it's like a giant waterfall of goodness that he's constantly pouring out upon us. Romans 2.4 says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? You know, when I came to Christ and then I realized how good he is, I mean, that's what really changed me. It's like, I don't want to do these things anymore because God is so good to me. He has saved me completely. He's given me such grace and mercy. And I want to live for him because God is so good. And you don't want to keep living for these things of the world. And so his goodness, it says, leads us to repentance. Over and over, there's this phrase that's found in Psalm 107. Here's an example, verses 8 and 9. It says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Now, it's so amazing that you can find true satisfaction, again, only in Jesus and in the things he has for us. And that should supersede anything of this world that tries to pull you in tries to trip you up and says, oh no, I've got something here that's good for you. That's Satan's lie because he wants to bind us up in our sin. Here it also says he abounds in truth. In other words, everything about God is true. Everything he says is true. From Genesis to Revelation, period, is God's truth. No other books written by men that claim to be God's word are his word, only 
God's word, the Bible, which you have in your hand, Genesis to Revelation, is his truth. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the truth. You can't get to heaven by your good works, by your own efforts. You can't earn your way. You don't buy your way. You can't do anything to make it to heaven except through the truth that Jesus loves you. He died for you. He shed his blood for your sins. You must receive him as your Lord and Savior, and then he will save you because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Revelation 3.14, Jesus calls himself the faithful and true witness. Again, when you look at Jesus, you, you get the full picture of who God is. Jesus prays to the Father, John 17.17, 17, where he says, Sanctify them in what? Truth. What is truth? Your word is truth. Then he says in verse 7, Keeping mercy for thousands. The word keeping means maintaining. He maintains his mercy for thousands. In other words, it'll never wear out. God's mercy will never run out. Again, it's a cascading waterfall of goodness and mercy and truth and grace. Lamentations 3.22 says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I love the fact that every morning his mercies are new. He never runs out. And again, it's his goodness that should motivate us. Paul says to the Corinthians, it's the love of Christ that constrains me or literally motivates me. Why am I living for Jesus and not for the world? Paul says, because the love of Jesus is at work in me. And it's his love that constrains me and motivates me to preach the gospel to those who are lost and dying in their sins. They need to know the Lord. They need the word of truth. Then God says in verse 7, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. You know, these cover all of our sins. Some say iniquity refers to the results of our sin. Some say iniquity is, you know, just because we have a sin nature, we just naturally sin. The consequences of our sin. We know transgression is easier to translate. It's basically transgression is deliberately crossing the line. God draws a line here. Don't cross it, Jeff. This line here, you mean I can't stick my foot out there and, and you know, test the water? You know, we do. And then it's like, why did I do that? That was so dumb. But we deliberately do something against the Word of God. We know it's wrong, but we do it anyway. That's transgression. Sin simply means missing the mark. And it came out of the English in, in England you know, they put up a bullseye, and when they would shoot an arrow trying to hit the bullseye, if they missed, they were called a sinner. And that's where it comes from. That's the definition we have of it, is missing the mark. So, the Olympics are coming up here shortly, and let's say you get the, the long jumper, the greatest long jumper. Whoever wins the gold medal, I don't have any idea who they might be today. I think Bob Beeman was the guy back in my day. They jump over 30 feet. That's amazing. Now, if you go to any pier out in California, I'm from San Diego, and we got a lot of piers there, and you run as fast as you can, and that gold medalist jumps off the pier trying to hit Hawaii, <laughs> he's a sinner. Why? Because he missed the mark. It's impossible. And so here I go, run, 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 run off the pier, jump as hard as I can. 12 feet. <laughs> he might do over 30, I might do 12. Guess what? We're both sinners because we didn't get to Hawaii. I mean, that's the impossibility of any of us earning our way to heaven. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. None righteous, no, not one. But Jesus is the one. He's the road. He's the straight and narrow. He's the one that, in a sense, takes the pier all the way from San Diego to Hawaii, and, and we're walking on that with Jesus till we get to paradise, the real one up in glory. But be that as it may, we all we're born with a sin nature. We cannot save ourselves. So God is wanting us to know that there's no sin. There's no type of sin. Iniquity, transgression, sin doesn't matter. There's nothing that he cannot save, nothing he cannot forgive within our lives. And the ultimate proof and demonstration of God's love and forgiveness, again, it's seen at Calvary at the cross where Jesus 
died. He took upon himself the wrath and judgment we deserved when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's when he was receiving what we deserve for sin upon himself. Amazing. The substitutionary sacrifice of Christ, shedding his blood for us. Romans 5, 8, the last verse we'll look at, it says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Don't ever think, oh, you can't come to Christ unless you clean up your act first. There'll be those that will knock on your door. And yeah, we'll tell you how to become a better person. You know, there was false teachers like Robert Schuller. Jesus came to make good people better. Are you kidding me? I was never good. You were never good. We're all sinful. He didn't come to make good people better. He came to take sinners and make us into, turn us into saints, being a new creation in Christ. The other side of the coin here, though, for those who reject God's love, His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness, they will face God's judgment. That's why he says here, by no means clearing or excusing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Be careful with this verse. It doesn't matter if your dad was... A, so I use myself and as, a, as an example. My parents were both very, very bad people, you know, horrible alcoholics, uh, did horrible things, and it didn't mean... That's going to be passed on to me because I grew up thinking, I'm never going to be like them. I wasn't a Christian. I'm never going to be like them. Then I get into college, San Diego State. I'm never... Well... There's a kegger tonight, huh? I'm never going to be like, and I got into it. I'm drinking like a fish. It was crazy. And then, though, I get kicked off the team, and that led me to real. That was the end of my rope, which was shallow. But the end of my rope, and I come to Christ, and he took away all that desire. And guess what? That generational, so-called generational curse was broken. Jesus breaks whatever cycle your parents or grandparents were into, whether it was witchcraft or anything, when you come to Christ, that cycle ends. That, that, that uh, uh, generational curse can be broken instantly. And again, I'm living proof that those cycles of sin can stop simply when you come to Jesus. Now, the reason this is important is because Exodus 20, when he's giving the Ten Commandments, he's very clear in verses 5 and 6. He'll, it says here he'll visit the iniquity of, upon the father's children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me. So don't ever forget that. It's to those who hate me. But when you come to Christ and you realize he loves you, now I love him. I love because he first loved me. It, that curse is broken. Real quickly, look at verse 8. We'll pick up here next time. But it says in verse 8, So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth, and worshiped. What else are you going to do? You just saw the glory of God. His name was given to you. And he falls down. He worships the Lord. And then Moses said here in verse 9, If now I have found grace in your sight. This is like the sixth time grace is mentioned here in the Old Testament in this section. If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. And he, the Lord, said, Behold, I make a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. So we'll stop here. We'll pick up here next time because we're going to see that God gives them that covenant over again. He renews that covenant that they broke. He renews it with them. But the bottom line is this. Even after the Israelites sinned horribly against God by making and worshiping the gold calf, God in his grace, God in his mercy gives them a do-over. In a sense, hits the delete button and gives them a new start. He renews his covenant, his promises to Moses and the children of Israel. Once again, is there anything too hard for God? Is there anything you or I have done that God cannot forgive? I encourage you, read over these verses this week once again. Let the Holy Spirit 
reveal these truths to you once again. Let him wash over you. Let Jesus forgive you and cleanse you if you're caught up into anything. You know, the blood of Christ, 1 John 1, 7 says, the blood of Christ cleanses us. It's in the present tense. It's an ongoing cleansing of all sin. Ephesians 5 says they were washed in the water of the Word. So you get the rivers of living water, the Holy Spirit, you get the blood of Jesus, you get the Word of God, all working to, like scrubbing bubbles. <laughs> working on us, cleansing us, refreshing us, renewing us, giving us the strength to go on, knowing that God is with us always, even to the end of this age.